Hey guys, it's me, Seren, back with another video. It is extremely hot. I hope everybody is staying cool, staying hydrated, drinking lots of water, um, really taking care of you, yourselves as best you guys can. Uh, this video might seem a little bit dim. It might also be a little bit noisy. I have the air conditioning on. I have a fan on. I have all the windows closed. Um, I don't want to turn any lights on because it's just so, so, so hot. So hopefully this isn't too dark for you guys. It's not too noisy for you guys because this is going to be my long-awaited video on the Postal Service that I've been working on for a while now. So I'm actually going to start at the at the end, um, which is really the middle because who knows how this is going to change. But I'm going to sort of start with a lot of the most prevalent issues as of August you know, 2020 with the post office, and I'm going to work my way back. So the Postal Service has been in the news quite a bit over the entire summer. I first started hearing a lot of people talking about uh, concerns with the Postal Service in about April of 2020, and I've been following this story really, really closely as it develops. Currently in August, a lot of people are extremely concerned because the previous postmaster, I believe her name was Megan, I'll give you guys her exact name later on, stepped down, and the new postmaster that was appointed by Donald Trump is a Trump supporter as well as a uh, Republican donor to his campaign. There has been a long, 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 long history of repeated attempts to privatize the United States Postal Service, which is a branch of the, it's a part of the United States government, and it's actually closely regulated by the government and by Congress. And when I say like a long time, I mean like going, going back to like, the late 80s and the early 90s, there's been this push to privatize the United States Postal Service. The main reason being that people want money. Motherfuckers are fucking capitalists, and they don't like the fact that the United States Postal Service does not serve as a capitalistic moneymaker for the government, but as a public good. The point of the Postal Service is to make sure that everyone, especially those people that are living in rural areas, people that are living in, you know, less densely populated areas are able to get their mail and are also able to get their mail at an affordable price, that they don't have to pay more because they live in the middle of nowhere, and also to ensure that when election time comes, they will be able to mail in their ballot, vote by ballot. It's also to ensure that people that are absentee voters, so people that are maybe not living in the place, the city or the state where they are registered, that they're still able to vote. And of course, we're in an election year, so what is Donald Trump trying to really do? Dismantle the Postal Service, and he has said out of his own mouth that a large part of it is because it's an election year, and he has concerns about people being able to vote. Of course, he has this framed as, you know, I'm concerned about false voting, I'm concerned about mail fraud, I'm concerned about voter fraud, but really this is about voter suppression. Uh, a lot of you guys may have been seeing a lot of talks about the Postal Service in tandem with the Electoral College because again, part of why the Electoral College exists is to ensure that people that live in more rural areas, less densely populated areas, are able to have a say, are able to have a vote. Historically, this has also been tied to American chattel slavery, as you generally had people that didn't support slavery that lived in the cities, and a lot of the times you had the slaveholders that were living in the rural South, you know, living in the country, wanting to be able to, you know, still have political power and not just have the political power in the hands of the cities, which we still have this kind of fight to this day over the Electoral College, and the United States Postal Service is really, really tied closely and intrinsically to this. Uh, there was supposed to be a hearing on the new postmaster's dismantling of um, the USPS and kind of starting over organizationally in September. That's actually been bumped up to next week. Today is August 17th. That's actually been bumped up to next week because there are, you know, increase people are becoming increasingly alarmed about the state of the Postal Service. There have been reports of them removing mailboxes. There have been reports of the new postmaster removing the high-speed mail machines. And the postmaster, I believe his name is DeJoy. I'm going to tell you guys these people's exact names. I'm just kind of giving you the rundown really, really quick. Um, the postmaster has said that he's doing these things as an in an attempt to overhaul the Postal Service. You know, he, he is a Republican. For decades, the Republicans have had an issue with the fact that what 
they feel that the Postal Service doesn't make enough money. In 2006, Congress actually voted that the USPS had to pre-fund pensions for postal workers. And so $5 billion is allocated out of the United States Postal Service at the very least every year for this, and they're basically running out of money. The Postal Service is not privatized, it's not owned by a private entity, it's not owned by a person, it's not owned by the government. So let's say, talk about how, for example, Jeff Bezos bought the Washington Post, now he privately funds the Washington Post. I believe the Atlantic was bought uh, by a philanthropic billionaire and is now privately funded. What the Republicans are really pushing for is the privatization of the Postal Service so that one person or one entity, one corporation, you know in the United States, corporations are motherfucking people, owns the Postal Service and is able to sort of drive prices, the prices of stamps, the prices of envelopes, the prices to ship, you know, instead of having set low prices, because this is supposed to be a public service by the United States government, just like how, you know, you're supposed to be able to send your children to public school if you want for free and have them still get a quality education. This is supposed to be a service that's provided by the United States government to ensure that all people can receive mail, can send mail, and ultimately can vote via the mail. Republicans are trying to privatize all that shit. They're trying to make it so that it's in the hands of an individual or a corporation and preferably one that's in the Republicans' back pocket like this recently appointed postmaster. Alarm bells are ringing. Alarm bells are ring gang about all of this. So in addition to all of this, I'm going to go back a little bit. When I first started following this story in April, the big issue was that the United States Post Office, excuse me, was running out of money, right? That they just don't have enough money. They have to sink all these money, this money into pensions. Trump has long said, Republicans have long said that the issue with the USPS is that they don't want to raise prices to be competitive, going up against Amazon, going up against FedEx, going up against DHL, that they need to raise their prices. And if they can't raise their prices, they need to basically sell the Postal Service off to the highest bidder that's going to be able to fund them, right? But as as I started following this story back in April when they were originally running out of money, my biggest issue with it back then was that the United States Post Office has long been a way for black Americans in the United States to become upwardly mobile. It has long been seen as a stable job with really good benefits, with decent pay, and a way for black Americans who are by and large overemployed by USPS to sort of get a foothold in and be able to, you know, save money, hopefully become homeowners, hopefully begin to create some wealth. The United States Postal Service has long been a way for us to do that. So when they originally started sounding these alarm bells back in April that they were running out of money, the very first concern that a lot of people had was, you know, if the USPS runs out of money and they have to lay people off or, you know, God forbid, they end up going under. That's going to be a what has historically, you know, for centuries since the beginning of the Postal Service, since Stagecoach Mary, who I did a hidden figures on, since since the Wild West, when black Americans freed slaves or former slaves were hired to go out to the West to escort the mail and to become, you know, postmasters. You know, that was us. Like, this is something that has historically been ours and has benefited us. And I feel like there hasn't been a ton of discussion about this. But I, I honestly, like, I would not be surprised to learn that a huge part of the sort of Republican aim to torpedo USPS has not you know, in addition to voter suppression, had a racial undertone, you know? And it's interesting to me because prior to all this, you know, voter suppression talk, Democrats were also not super on board with saving USPS, okay, until it, it, it turned into, like, a voting, a voting right thing. In April and May and June, when we were talking about Black Americans are going to really feel this if USPS goes under, there was just a lot of shrugging and kind of like, well, you know, we'll figure it out. We'll worry about it when we get there. But now that we're talking about voter suppression, people are just sounding these alarms, which even gets me back to my last stream of what I was talking about last week of Black Americans so often finding ourselves between a rock and a hard place in terms of, you know, when, when we are the canary in the coal mine and when things are bidding fitting, are, are, you know, are benefiting us and then they're going to, you know, be used to our detriment, nobody really cares. And yet these things, by and large, over time, snowball into larger and larger issues that always end up affecting the American public as a whole. And then three, four, five months later, motherfuckers get concerned. Like, how about you listen to black Americans from the beginning when we start, you know? So... A lot of people are just really concerned as well that with COVID and an election year, with people that are not going to be really comfortable with, you know, 
going to polling places, being inside, standing in long lines with a lot of people, that there's going to be an influx of people anyway that would want to, you know, vote by mail, that it's, it's an election year, so there's just always an influx of mail. And it seems like they're trying to undermine, you know, the ability for people to vote via mail when there will be, you know, most likely substantially less in-person voting. And just in addition to that, like, overall, the way that we use the Postal Service is, you know, it is a service. Like, it's an essential service. Like, people receive their Social Security checks through the mail. People receive their prescription drugs through the mail. You know, again, senior citizens, rural citizens, you know, people, the, the prices of the mail are able to stay low, which Donald Trump hates because he's a capitalist. He feels like, why is the Postal Service not making me more money? Why is it not making the government more money? Why are the prices low? Why are they not competitive with Amazon? You know, he's really repeatedly lit into the Postal Service as, you know, people being lazy, they're not money makers, you know, he appointed this dude saying that now he's removing the sorting machines and the mailboxes, and he's closing down post offices, and he's saying, oh, it's because we're preparing for a complete overhaul, you know, a revamp of the Postal Service to make sure that it makes more money, and you have people that are like, well, is now the time for that, you know, we're getting ready to have to vote via mail, right? It seems very suspicious and so now they've moved up this hearing to next week so they're they're going to try they're having a congressional hearing to see if you know laws are being broken which they are so i'm just going to read you guys some excerpts uh from some articles that i have saved on this that i will include links in the description box uh from and these are from you know over the summer my earliest one that i have saved is from april 17th that's what i'm looking at right now u.s postal service will soon collapse without emergency funds the U.S. Postal Service will run out of money by the end of September if Congress doesn't provide emergency funding, according to, this is the Postmaster General at the time, Postmaster General Megan Brennan, who gave a private briefing to some members of Congress on Thursday. The news comes at, this was April 17th, the news comes as the Postal Service is hemorrhaging cash from the coronavirus pandemic and hundreds of postal workers have fallen ill with COVID-19. So again, this was kind of the beginning of the story, which was that, the Postal Service has been kind of like not making money for a while. There were a lot of concerns about, you know, um, mail carriers getting sick, not wanting to come into work, being essential workers, but not having protection. All of these things kind of started floating around when, when COVID really started kicking into gear in late spring. And with the original coronavirus bill that was passed, uh, the Stimulus Act, they refused to allocate money to the Postal Service. Brennan told members of the House Oversight and Reform Committee that the COVID-19 pandemic is having a devastating effect on our business because people stopped sending out mail at a time when America needs the Postal Service more than ever. USPS expects to lose at least $13 billion in revenue directly related to the economic slowdown caused by the coronavirus crisis and will lose billions more over the next decade. The Postal Service Board of Governors, which was appointed by President Donald Trump, has asked Congress to provide $25 billion in emergency funding for USPS, and Trump said no. And this old postmaster, Megan Brennan, stepped down. Some lawmakers, postal union representatives, and others who rely on the service now fear that the Trump administration is trying to use the current crisis to achieve conservatives' longstanding goal of nudging the mail service toward privatization, either by setting highly prescriptive loan terms or by essentially forcing it into bankruptcy. And now we have this new general postmaster after the old one, Megan, stepped down, that's saying that he's doing a complete overhaul. And it really seems like he's stripping the service down to just completely dismantle it. It's almost like some type of corporate espionage. I watched this documentary on how uh, this was what was done to like Sears. Like they hired this CEO and he just like brick by brick dismantled the brand, stripped it, sold everything off, steered it into bankruptcy, collected his little money and moved on, you know, like vulture, vulture type shit. The Postal Service is fighting for its survival, putting in jeopardy the careers and paychecks of its 650,000 employees who are overemployed, you know, black Americans by and large, as well as the more than $1.7 trillion mailing industry that employs more than 7.5 million people. We cannot allow the Postal Service to collapse. To do so would deepen our nation's economic crisis and eliminate an important lifeline for individuals who rely on the Postal Service's 
1 billion deliveries of life-saving prescription deliveries and eviscerate the very infrastructure we need to administer the upcoming elections. Those of you that watched my previous live stream where I talked about this topic, you guys heard me mention, you know, I have Star Wars on the brain, but this is really giving me like Senator Palpatine. Like they're trying to dismantle one of the main ways that people are going to feel safe voting. And, you know, what's going to happen when November rolls around? Uh, African Americans make up about 20% of U.S. Postal Service workers and are the majority in some urban centers, representing 75 to 80% of the letter carriers in the Chicago area, for example. U.S. Post Office cuts threaten a major source of black jobs. So then I read this other really wonderful article, this was also back in April, in Jacobin, that of course I'm going to link, that was called Defend the Post Office, Defend Black Workers. And it started with, there's a line that's repeated throughout the 1987 movie, Hollywood Shuffle, Barbara Townsend, genius, as a sort of inside joke for black viewers who are watching. There's always work at the post office. It's a wink at a commonly uttered phrase by black people in America, but it's also equipped with a serious material basis for black workers who have found in the U.S. Postal Service employment stability and upward mobility for generations. Many prominent black Americans paid the bills by working the mail as they pursued their larger ambitions. Dick Gregory worked as a postal worker in Chicago during the daytime before refining his stand-up routine at night. Richard Wright worked in the post office, and even the famous communist Harry Haywood worked for the Postal Service after fighting in World War I. For the average black worker, the Postal Service represents a stable, decent-paying career that is hard to find elsewhere. Today, the average salary of a USPS employee is $55,000, and 21% of USPS employees are black. The history of black postal workers demonstrates the critical importance of government employment, and as someone from D.C., I feel like this can't be overstated. Like, every nigga you know works a government job. They work at the DMV, they work at the post office, they work somewhere federal. And a robust public sector for the advancement of black people in this country. In 2019, and now 2020, the Postal Service, just like the public sector more generally, is under attack from Republicans and centrist Democrats alike. And I like that they included that, because now that we're talking about voter suppression, they're kind of trying to turn this into a partisan issue, like as if it's a Republican problem. Like, no, it's a Democratic problem, too. This attack represents a severe threat to the living standards of a large section of black workers and their families. When we're just talking about black workers going under, nobody gives a shit. But this is a huge bipartisan problem. The story of black workers in the post office begins with the legal end of slavery and the soldiers who fought for that freedom. As early as 1861, Federal employment was opened up for black workers, and in December 1864, Senator Charles Sumner passed a bill banning discrimination in postal employment. Though not always enforced, this protection was critical for enabling black workers to establish a foothold in a relatively stable and secure op occupation. Excuse me. Many black Union Army veterans joined the Postal Service after the Civil War ended. During the 1930s and 1940s, black civil rights activity had a decidedly working class character and was closely intertwined with the labor movement, which is how you have black activists that come along like Fannie Lou Hamer or like Johnny Tillman that are fighting for, you know, working class rights. This development was reflective of the heightened status and political importance black postal workers had attained by this time. Black postal workers and their unions formed a crucial pillar of this black labor alliance, and in 1935, blacks made up nearly a third of the postal workers of America in New York City and 12% of all public workers. By 1940, 14% of all black workers who earned above the national median income worked for the post office. So historically, we've been able to use jobs, you know, in the post office, again, as a way of becoming upwardly mobile in the United States. Postal workers also played an important role in expanding the working class base of the NAACP in the 1920s and 30s. They displaced the talented 10th, you know, the silk stocking crowd, the Dubois mentality of like the people that need to lead, black Americans need to be, you know, you know, niggas that think they're better than the rest of us. Like, no, it needs to be the average 
black person, the working class black person, the black American, excuse me, the shift to unions and working class activists taking the lead on civil rights issues was a dramatic change to the ideology of what black leadership was supposed to look like. In an era when unionized blue and white collar employment was becoming a stepping stone to a middle class lifestyle, auto workers and meat packers, nurses and postal workers displaced the talented 10th as agents of black community advancement. They also talk in this piece about how the postal service jobs were a crucial way of black women, black American women, entering into the workforce. The Equal Pay Act of 1963 was also a key factor in helping black women find work. For many black women, federal employment in the post office was a refuge from the highly unfavorable conditions that confronted them in the private sector. A monthly newsletter from the Manhattan Bronx Postal Union in 1966 described the situation. It is important to note that most of the women coming into the post office are Negroes. Reflecting conditions in the American economy and the unfair treatment that they have received on the outside down through the years, these women are coming to work into the federal government hoping that they will get a fair shake. In fact, the post office was one of the only federal civilian agencies that saw an entry of large numbers of blacks and women. In 2006, Congress passed the Postal Accountability and Enhancement Act. This act manufactured a financial crisis for the Postal Service by forcing them to pre-fund all retiree health care costs 75 years into the future even for workers not yet born. No other company or government agency has to abide by such a law. This alone has robbed the USPS of an estimated $5.6 billion over a 10 year period. Clearly, this is part of a broader plan, and this goes back to 2006, okay? Like this is not new, like this has de been decades in the making. Clearly, this is part of a broader plan to privatize the Postal Service and attack the living standards of postal workers, especially Black Americans. Privatizing will only lead to reduced services and higher prices, as happened in the UK when the country privatized its postal system in 2015. Today, one in five Black workers is employed in a government job. The slower recovery for Blacks in the labor market is partly due to federal job cuts. In 2000, the median income of black men who worked full-time in the public sector was 15% higher than those who worked full-time in the private sector. For black women, it was 19% higher. Good postal service job, like black women are, are, are like really benefiting off of being employed by the postal service. Good postal service jobs are ones we can't afford to lose. Uh, and as of today, August 17, 2020, just going to read a little bit of current information. I knew this man's name was DeJoy, the new postmaster. Postmaster General Louis DeJoy has agreed to appear for a U.S. House Oversight Committee hearing next week. DeJoy, who is an ally of President Trump's and a major Republican donor, took over leadership of the Postal Service in May. And pressure has grown throughout the summer for him to answer questions about his plans to implement an organizational realignment at the agency. The American people want their mail, medicines, and mail-in ballots delivered in a timely way, and they certainly do not want drastic changes and delays in the midst of a global pandemic just months before the election. Like, we don't want that, and we also can't afford to lose these jobs for Black Americans. Concern about the changes was bubbling a month ago as they went into effect, but Trump's comments in which he seemed to tie USPS funding to his hope of hampering mail-in voting expansions drastically increased the urgency for lawmakers. House Speaker Nancy Pelosi is calling the House back in a session this week to pass a bill aimed at halting any changes within the Postal Service that would affect the level of service this fall. The oversight hearing with DeJoy, which was originally planned for September, is now moved up to August 24th, and DeJoy is basically going to have to explain these issues. So, you know, you guys have, I'm sure, been seeing a lot of, like, save the post office, save the post office, save the post office, and we absolutely need to save the post office. We need to support the post office. We need to support post office workers, and especially black Americans. Like, it's, it's, voter suppression obviously is huge, obviously. But it's not just about voter suppression. Aside of from, you know, bipartisan politics, which you guys know how I feel about that. I feel like our bipartisan system is damaged beyond repair and I don't believe in it. But even outside of that, we're talking about, you know, black Americans and 
something that's going to affect us and something that's been affecting us and something that nobody cared about <laughs> until it started to affect their politics. So think about that. Support the post office. Support the post office. Write to your local officials. Buy stamps. Buy postcards. Sign petitions. Email. Mail. This is going to have a huge impact on black American workers. So this is something that we really need to stay on top of. Food for thought as always. There will be links and information in the description box. See you guys next time. Save USPS. Peace.